Hi, I'm Cassie. And I'm Mariah. And this is the Cassie and Mariah Show, a podcast where two long-distance internet friends, that's us, discuss navigating their 20s through disability and chronic illness. Mariah, how are you doing today? I'm doing good. I'm just hanging out. You know, it's it's a nice, cool day in uh, New Jersey, and didn't do much today, but that's all right. Nice, chill Sunday. Love that for you. Um, it's a snow day here in Oregon, um, which, like, you know, anytime, like, a speck of snow falls from the sky, it's a snow day. I don't know, like, did you, okay, when you were going to school as a kid, like, were snow days, are snow days a thing in New Jersey, like, at school, like, is school closed all the time for snow? Yeah, of of course. I mean, like, we, as, from what I remember when I was in, like, elementary school, we would have days where we would have, like, snow days and school would be canceled for like three days or you'd have like a half day delayed openings like stuff like that but right. i feel like we've had a lot of days where it was just like oh don't come to school today like or people also <laughs> another thing is what people would like in high school people would kind of like low-key bully our superintendent on twitter <laughs> And be like, hey, cancel school today. Like, hey, can you cancel school? Like, nobody wants to go to school. And then they would tweet, like, school's canceled today. And people would be like, yeah. I'm like, sending them, like, GIF, like, replies and stuff on Twitter is actually really funny. (laughs) So. Wow. There's probably a lot of days that were canceled that didn't need to be. But, you know, it's fine. (laughs) Oh, for sure. That's, okay, that's good to hear. Because I feel like people are always, like, so dramatic about how, like, in Oregon especially like anytime yeah a snowflake falls from the sky everything shuts <laughs> down um but glad to know it is indeed normal in the northeast I mean who knows about other states I guess but I think it's really funny because like we also would have that where it's like oh like it's gonna get like three inches of snow you know everybody might as well go buy everything in the grocery store acting like we're not gonna oh, leave yeah. our house for days or like make sure you have all your stuff to like shovel out your car and it's like okay if anything it's just gonna be like a sheet of ice so I don't think you're going to have to be shoveling anything out. Yeah, we just haven't had any snow days lately, um, unfortunately, which is really a bummer because I love snow days. I love that, like, opportunity to sit home and have our hot chocolate and to have an excuse to just play video games, watch movies. Like, it's just the vibes are immaculate on snow days. Well, Mariah, I'm ready for you to rattle off your stats. I'm ready to hear the concoction <laughs> of what's going on in your in, in my body. In my personified haunted house. So, yes. howdy. I'm Mariah, for those who don't know. I am, like, the chronic illness half of this podcast, I feel. I have cystic fibrosis, which is a funny disease within itself. Um, I have postural yes. tachycardia syndrome, which is also abbreviated as POTS, P-O-T-S. I have, like, I call it, like, low-key cystic fibrosis-related diabetes because I haven't been officially diagnosed, but it's something that kind of, like, primarily just shows up on my blood work and then, like, will go away and then comes back. So, like, that's a whole thing. And I just have, like, some, like, spritz of little, like, anxiety disorders to, like, finish off the little, you know, Christmas tree that is me. I, so let's start from the top. Um, Cystic fibrosis is a disease that, like, primarily affects your pancreas really yeah it's a did digestive not know that. system disease the whole thing it's genetic can't spread it to anybody trust me i've tried I'm kidding <laughs> <laughs> so basically like a genetic mutation so both of your parents would need to be carrying a specific gene in order for their child to have this disease and within cf there's multiple different genes The main one that I have is, like, one that I think, like, 50% of the population that has CF has. It's, like, basically you need two genes to have CF. Like, if you only have one, then you're a carrier, which means that if you have, like, children with another person that's a carrier, then you're one of your, you have, like, a one in four chance of your kids having CF. So, for me, both my parents had the genes, which, like, when they, uh, like, had me, you know, there wasn't a lot of testing that was done to see, um if your baby was going to have CF, like nowadays you could get like blood work done or you get like certain um, testing done, like a whole graph that will tell you like, oh, if your kids are going to have any like predetermined illnesses when they're born. So back then, like, you know, back in 1997 when I was born, they didn't have any of that. Um, Or at least it wasn't like as known or as used as it is now. So I was diagnosed at birth. Mm -hmm. And so they figured it out because I... uh, 
uh, so there's a few reasons of how they figured it out almost. Um, one of them was like, literally, I couldn't like go to the bathroom. <laughs> I couldn't, uh, like my intestines were like blocked. I couldn't go to the bathroom. I, every time I ate, I like would end up getting like throwing up or just like wouldn't eat. So what they had to do was they basically like opened up my stomach um, and they did this surgery that's called like a meconium illness, which um, no matter how many times I could try to say that word, I will never say it the right way, um, which oh, is I like <laughs> basically they open they open your intestines and they find like there's like parts of my intestines that were like tangled and blocked. And that was like why I couldn't go to the bathroom. And okay. they take those intestines and they uh, have to basically untangle your intestines. And for the first like few, like, I think it was like first like month of my life, I had like an ileostomy bag, which is like, for those of you who don't know, you're, it's like a, they thread your intestines like through the outside of your stomach. And then you have a bag on your stomach that you basically go to the bathroom out of. Really cool, really fun, really messy. Uh, I know my mother <laughs> has told me she had many, uh, many crying episodes over having to take care of a baby with this Aww. bag because obviously kids like don't know what it is so like half the time you probably like are taking it off or you know like it gets like really backed up right. um and then you have to like constantly replace it so i um the ileostomy bag was like a big headache glad i don't have that um and you know so like that's one of the parts about getting diagnosed is like having the surgery done and then also like there's many tests that they do on babies there's a thing called a sweat test which is like when you sweat they take like it's like a sample of it or something and they test it for having cf because people with cf their sweat is incredibly salty so you know the sweat test is another big thing that you know how they diagnose like babies with having cf my diagnosis actually led to my cousin being diagnosed as well because he had the same issues i had when i was born but I, I think with him is like oh. they misdiagnosed him at first or they said it was something else because him and I share the one gene that we both got from like oh. our mothers. And then like he has a rarer gene and then I have another gene that we don't share. But that's another thing. So each person with CF is completely different from one another. And the cool thing is that we are kind of even not allowed to like hang out with one another in person because people with CF can spread their like everybody that has CF basically has like a bacteria in their lungs that another person won't have. So like if you spend too much time with another person on CF, you can transfer that bacteria to them and then they can also get it, you know, they can also transfer their bacteria to you. And um, that's why, mm. you know, there's a whole like five feet apart rule, you know, pre-COVID for people with CF because you kind of weren't allowed to hang out with one another you know, due right. to, like, be able to spread each other's sicknesses. Because, like, along with, like, CF isn't, like, an immune disorder, but because of the medications that we're all on, it does suppress our immune systems. Like, the reason, so, you know, back to being CF, being a pancreatic digestive system disease, it's, like, basically your pancreas uh, doesn't, like, perform the way that a normal person does. So you have to take, like, digestive enzymes to help digest food. So I have to take, mm. like, six of these red pills every time I eat. Which people at the pharmacy always say, that's a lot of pills. And I'm like, I know. That's the point. <laughs> so <Yeah. laughs> I, um, and like, because of the, um, it's like also you produce a lot of mucus throughout your body. So between like your lungs having this mucus inside, your pancreas, your digestive system having this mucus inside, it's like all of your organs will have like an overabundance of mucus, which like, you know, or like people mm -hmm. would usually have mucus in their lungs when they're they're sick, they have a cold, stuff like any like bacterial infection. But people with CF have mucus in their lungs all the time. Um, sometimes it gets worse and then sometimes it like, you know, the mucus can be the reason why you're constantly sick because um, bacteria and like a any like sort of like stuff can stick to that mucus and then like the mucus will kind of help it spread and um, get really sick. So, um, whenever I would get sick, I would have to get like a pick line, which would be a, mm. uh, basically like an, uh, like an IV that you can use when you're not home. So a pick line gets inserted in your, I mostly got them in my arms, like my upper, like inside my bicep area here. Um, and it's like a line that goes, it's almost like a catheter and it goes straight into like your heart, um, or like in your upper, um, like blood vessels that run directly through your heart, like in the top of your chest. And the pick lines would help like distribute antibiotics throughout your body. Um, mm -hmm. A lot of those antibiotics when I was taking when I was younger, I would get like 
allergic to, which was always a nightmare. Oh. Um, having an allergic reaction through something that's uh, a like being dispersed like through your veins, and then you feel it all throughout your body, and then all of a sudden you're like, oh, Ooh. I don't feel well. And I it resulted in me having to also be on these antibiotics through a pick line to also be like using getting like a bag of like a hundred or a thousand milliliters of like fluid every time I did these at home treatments. So the fluid would help like flush it out through your system. But if you're not, if you don't do the fluids, then that's how you would get sick and just really like, it's like basically you need to be like super hydrated or at least I would be to get these medications done. Um, gotcha. I've also had like along with CF, um, it really affects your sinuses as well. Basically, like affects all the you know, all the extra nooks and crannies throughout your body. <laughs> but <laughs> it was like the digestive system, your lungs, and your sinuses being the primary things it would affect. So my sinuses would be, I'd get like polyps in my sinuses, which are basically they're like non-cancerous like lumps in your sinuses that would need to be removed because otherwise they'll just grow and then you can't breathe through your nose. You won't be able to like smell anything. Oh. Um, so I, I had eight sinus surgeries throughout my whole life. Um, basically where they go in there and they take all that stuff out. And then like a year later, I'd have to get that same surgery done again. Cause then it would just grow back. And then oh. I'd also have to do like sinus rinses, which that was always a joy to do. Um, I would have to, you know, so I had my eight sinus surgeries. I've had like about six pick lines throughout my life. Um, one midline, which is basically a pick line, but it's in like the crevice of like your elbow. And I would have that done because I like, I basically, I had a surgery when I was in middle school where it was like, I think it was like my freshman year of high school. I've had a pick line surgery where they did not place it right the first time. And it was a complete nightmare and they ruined this. Like they built up so much scar tissue in my like inner part of my bicep that I couldn't get any more pick lines because it was just like they wouldn't stick like they literally oh. wouldn't stay and it was very disgusting um <laughs> and then so that, that's where my midline came in and then after my midline um I still needed you know a year later still needed antibiotics still needed this stuff and they're kind of like okay well like we don't really have a choice but like you need to get like a port calf placed which Porticaths are, I feel like you primarily see them for like cancer patients who get like their medication through them and they're like chemo through them. So this way it's like, you're not, cause like pick lines and midlines are very temporary things. They can only be kept in for a few months. Um, otherwise like it just kind of does it like they can stop working. They can easily just get clogged. That's happened to me multiple times where your body almost like develops a blood clot at the end of the pick line and then it can't be used anymore. So it needs to be removed. Oh. So the porticath. Um, is like a device that's placed underneath your skin. It's a little disc and the disc has a tube that goes into like the same area where the pick line would sit like into your heart. Um, and the portacath can be placed almost like, I think it can be placed anywhere that they can like sew it onto a muscle underneath your skin. I would get, I had one above my, I mean, on like my, uh, my left side, kind of like, I guess like underneath my clavicle, I had it placed there. Some people have had it placed, like, under here, like, almost by the rib cage, which I always thought was a really bad placement. <laughs> yeah. Also not the most convenient to Yeah, because, like, I mean, the thing is with the ports is that they always wanted you to have a home care nurse access them. You can never do it yourself, which I know people have had it okay. done themselves before, but... It's also one of those things where, like, if you don't do it right, if you don't stick it in the right spot of the port of calf, it's, like, uh, mm. it, doesn't, it doesn't work. You could easily, like, you know, bend the needle, and then it's, like, okay, now you have a whole other issue, you know? Like, basically, there's, like, so much that <laughs> has to go into, like, having a port, accessing it, and keeping it clean. Um, that was another thing I've had problems with, where it would get clogged, and then you have to go to the hospital, and they have to give you this, like, solution that helps unclog it. And that's a whole nightmare. Um, and, like, the porticath is basically, like, you know, it, it being a disc, like a round disc, it has almost like a target in the center of it. So you have to hit that target every time. But with hitting oh, that okay. target, it also develops, like, a lot of scar tissue on the top. So you would have sometimes where you have to really, like, push it in until it almost, like, clicks, like, till it hits the back of the port. Because um, otherwise, like, you ha- yeah, you have to get through that, like, rough scar tissue. You know, I've had... 
a lot of issues with my port. Thankfully, I got it taken out in 2021 um, in August. I was going to say, I remember, yeah, that was that was during the time we yes, were Yes, I had it taken out. <laughs> I mean, all in the day stay. Yeah. <laughs> in the day stay in the hospital. And I do have to say, I remember every second of it. Because I am, another thing with, you know, me is that I'm horrible under anesthesia. Oh, I no. almost can never get it done because of the, like, complications that follow. Like, I went into, like, liver failure one time after a surgery because of, like, the anesthesia they gave me. Um it kind of like ruled oh, out like no. I'm allergic to morphine, so like they cannot give me that. So it's a lot of yeah. There's a lot of issues. So when I had my portacath removed, they gave me a very general numbing anesthesia where I was still asleep. I actually no, I wasn't asleep, but I couldn't feel anything. I could feel the pressure, but I couldn't feel the pain. So I would feel them. I literally kind of felt it as like you know, it's like mm. you're pulling like a rope. Like I kind of felt that gotcha. that motion being done to my chest. When they're pulling it out, which was the grossest feeling, even worse. Yeah, no, I can. And imagine. even worse than this, they didn't even let me. They didn't even get to let. I didn't even get to like keep the port afterwards. <laughs> I forgot. You <laughs> because yeah. another thing with my multiple pick lines, I've kept them in jars, and um, I I recently did you know put on my big girl pants and I threw them out. But uh, I do I do miss them. I have to say, I kind of wish you kept them. Oh my god, I actually probably, I could probably find one. Like if I really thought about it, I've always was very tempted to open up the jars and smell it. <laughs> no, 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 no. <laughs> okay, no. You know, there's sometimes there's right. A line sometimes that you needs have to, to say drawn. the impulses that you have to say no. Don't do that. <laughs> no. But I know. I wish no. I got to keep my port. Um, they were like, oh, it's like you can't because it was inside your body, so it's a biohazard. And I'm like, but I'm not going to, like, do anything to it. Like, I just want to look at it. <laughs> um, another thing, too, random thing about, like, when I got my port placed when I was a senior in high school, um, they told me it was going to be on my right side, and then I woke up and it was on my left. And that was a crazy thing to me because I'm left-handed. So I was like, oh, my God, I don't want it on my left side. You know, because a lot of the things you were saying, it was, like, very consistent, like, throughout your childhood. So, I guess I'm kind of curious, like, what, like, what what it's like now, like, maintaining um, your health and, like, you know, like, are, because it sounds like you were regularly having to, yeah, have pick lines and have ports and now you're able to get your port removed last year or the year before. Oh, my yeah. God, it's 2023. Um, <laughs> but, yeah, I'm curious what it's like now. Um, so nowadays it's actually completely different, um, for a few reasons. So like I said, like when I was younger in like elementary school, I was constantly in the hospital. I would probably have at least almost three hospital visits a year. Um, and I'm talking about like being in there for like weeks at a time, coming home, you know, having to go back for a few weeks or like, I've also had like bronchoscopies done, which is that's like when they stick a tube down your throat and they look inside your lungs with like a camera and sometimes they'll take, like, um, like a sample of, like, the mucus in your lungs to, like, test it for other bacteria and stuff. Because, like, my lungs, um, when I was younger, too, my lung function was, like, not even 50%. Okay. Where, like, a normal person who gets a lung test done, they'd be, like, in the high 90s, okay. 100, stuff like that. Um, I, like, when I was younger, I always had, like, 30s, 40s, like, 50s, like you know, kind of in that area-ish. And it always depend on, like, if I, if I wasn't feeling well, if I was sick, it'd be low. But if I was feeling okay, I'd have a day where I'm, like, 60s. And I'm like, oh, wow, that's such a high number. Yeah. <laughs> you know? Um, so nowadays, I feel it's a bit of, like, a 180. Um, and that's due to the fact that I started a medication in 2019 um, called Trikafta. And it's basically a medication that is only for people with CF. And it's only for people that have a specific CF gene. Um, and I have that gene. So um, I started Trikafta and it's two pills in the morning, one pill at night. And it basically like recorrects the damage that the your genes do to your body. Okay. So like um, the first like month of being on Trikafta, I was my I was constantly like blowing my nose, coughing up stuff. It was like my body was literally like you know it's like 
I would, I would have these like days where it's like all I was doing is just like coughing up all the mucus that was in my okay. lungs. It was like my body was like purging yeah. itself pretty much. So, um, being on Tricaster for a few years now, um, I'm almost like at this point where my body feels like a normal body. Um, so I'm not like, I'm definitely not in the hospital that much. I, the, I think the only time I was in the hospital like last year when I had COVID, but like Obviously, that's a completely right. other thing. Um, but even prior to that, I was I was never in the hospital after taking Trikafta. Um, I was always, like, feeling... Um, I ease, like, my energy levels, like, have completely changed, too. Like, I actually can kind of, like, do things and try to, like, hold a job and, you know, stuff like a normal person would do. Starting Trikafta, I have... You know, completely, it's like a 180. I am, feel like I'm doing a lot better physically. I can actually, like, you know, go for walks and go up a flight of stairs without feeling like my lungs are going to collapse, which sounds like such a pathetic little thing. Um, You know, like, in high school, I had such a hard time going up the stairs. It was, like, a monolith, you know? Like, it was just something where I'm like, this is my own, like, mountain right now to climb. Yeah. Um, Yeah. And, you know, it's like getting to the top of those stairs, I was completely winded, like could not breathe, coughing up a lung. And, you know, it was always kind of like embarrassing because, you know, other kids are obviously behind you, walking around you and stuff. So it's like, oh, you get to the top of the stairs and you like can't breathe. Like, oh, you know, it's always like you need to work out more. You need to like, you know, it's always like, oh, you're like not fit enough. And it's like, no, I just like literally have like a quarter of the lung function that you do. Um, yeah. so I would say now, yeah, I'm like, I could go for a walk and like feel fine after, or like at least feel a little tired, but not as tired as I would. Um, I feel like I can hold, like, I could definitely like work better, like holding a job wise. Like I think it's mm-hmm. a lot easier for me to do cause I, I don't have as many days where I'm like physically sick. Um, right. I, uh. I just think it's, like, you know, another person I know that has CF made this analogy of it being, like, you lived in a glass box your whole life that once when that door opens, you don't know where else to go. Um, And I think that that's a very eye-opening thing to read from another person because it really describes how I feel where I'm, like, oh, you know, when I grew, when I was growing up, like, having CF was almost this, like, it was referred to as a childhood illness because people that had it never lived past the age of 18. And which is such a weird thing to be like, you know, in high school hearing that because you're like, oh, why am I going to have a future? Like, what's the point of planning for a future if like you don't even know if it's going to exist? Mm-hmm. And um, now I'm like, oh, cool. I'm 25. And I like don't know what I want to do. <laughs> <laughs> I, I literally didn't expect to be here. <laughs> um, oh, that would be... Well, and it's just, you know, fascinating to think about. It's like, you know, like you were saying, like when you were born, it's like there literally just wasn't like the, the science, the met, like the medical, like, you know, compared to the amount of tests that get run now and just like, it's like kind of amazing how much like it's all evolved just in the course of your life so far. Yeah. Like even just within the, within the past like 10 years, like, you know, I, I think about how, you know being in a room with kids that were planning on going to college and, like, planning on, like, what they're doing and talking about, like, you know, what they imagine their future to be like, and you're kind of like, oh, like, I don't think I'm ever going to get to that. Like, I don't think I'm ever going to have a day where I can, like, plan to have a family. And Mm. it's, you know, it was just this really, and it's, it's such a weird thing to explain to, like, other people because they're, like, oh, well, why wouldn't you want to be hopeful for the future? Why wouldn't you want to, like, imagine that things are better? And it's like, how can I when, like, nothing has been better? Like, you know, what am I, I'm imagining this future that's never going to get here. Like, why have my hopes up? And it sounds super morbid. Like, it sounds so, like, (laughs) you know, it sounds like, oh, like, that's, like, not a good mindset to have. But it's like, and it's not like, nobody, like, told me to think like this, right? Like, 
I wasn't, you know, it's like, oh, doctors always wanted the best for me. So they're not the ones telling me any of this. If anything, sometimes it was kids that were like, oh, you have CF. Like, don't you know that you're going to be dead at 19? Oh, and God. it's like, yeah, like as on my 19th birthday, I just disintegrate into a pile of dust. Like, oh. <laughs> I'm like, that doesn't happen. Because I've also had that, which that's another, you know, odd story is kids telling you your life expectancy as if it's like, I should just go home and like stop living <laughs> because oh, of stuff. Yeah. Um, but nowadays, like you say, all I really struggle with with is being mentally ill. <laughs> like, you're just like the rest of us. I'm just like the rest. I'm just like you. <laughs> yeah, when you're like, yeah, I don't know what I'm doing with my life. I'm like, welcome to welcome to normalcy. Congrats on being a normal. Like, welcome to your quarter life crisis. Glad you're here right? for it. <laughs> I'm so glad I could live to my quarter life crisis. <laughs> you know, being the the physically disabled side of this podcast, I'm like, damn how do I follow this up um (laughs) yeah I am yeah (laughs) um uh you know speaking of being a genetic anomaly (laughs) um I you know my I so my main thing that I've got going on is um that I have a form of dwarfism I also have like ADHD and like my mental health is questionable and (laughs) I'm also allergic to the sun but like those things aren't uh, the main shining the main star. star. Yeah. Uh, yeah, they're not the headlining act of my life. So true. Um, they're just the little, they're the, they're the sprinkles. They're, they're the, the side characters. The, the spice. Yes, they are the side <laughs> characters. Um, yeah, so, I mean, being born with dwarfism obviously was pretty easy for the most part, I think, for them to diagnose me um, as soon as I was born because they were like, <laughs> she's small. Because <laughs> um, uh, it's like, you know, I was full term, planned, like, C-section, like, you know, it was just, you know, most things were normal other than the fact that I was small. Um, so then I know um, that I went through a bunch of genetic testing after that because there are a bunch of different kinds of dwarfism so they were kind of trying to narrow down like which form that I had because it I it must have been pretty obvious that I didn't necessarily have like the more common like I know achondroplasia is like one of the more common forms of dwarfism um the one that I have is called SEDC um stands for some long word that I've never said because we just call it SEDC um which sounds like ACD. I was literally going to say that. I'm like, Sick ACDC. Band name. <laughs> um, and, you know, for me, the main ways that it affected me is that a lot of my bones twisted as I grew. So, like, especially my leg bones, um, like, my knees used to be bowed in when I was a kid. And, like, just, like, other, like, basically my whole, my legs were just really screwed up the more that I grew even though like I'm only three seven it's like obviously as a kid you're growing and so it's like as I grew my bones would twist and so I had like surgery basically every year of elementary school um I only had a total of six leg surgeries um but sometimes it would be both legs at the same time so I'd be in a double cast that would have a metal bar between them to hold my legs together oh my god wait would your like leg surgeries just help straighten your legs out yeah, pretty much. Um, so I've got like all sorts of like plates and screws and things throughout my legs. Um, I, you know, I don't fully know what all they did. And I mean, I guess the fact that my legs, like my knees don't bow in is nice and convenient. I do still wear um, leg braces that are like mainly for my ankles now because both of my feet, but especially my left foot really rolls to the outside when I walk without shoes. Um, they just could really never figure it out. They <laughs> kind of gave up trying. They were like, uh, this is good enough. Um, and I was like, sure, whatever. Um, and also my left leg has just always kind of been my worst leg. Don't really know why. Cause again, most her. of this was, yeah, right. <laughs> um, most of this was when I was in elementary school. So like, I don't really remember a ton of like the technicalities. I was just like, sure, whatever. Next, you know, on to the next thing. Um, but, uh, they, because they did more work on my left leg, they would have to often take pieces of bone out. So that leg's actually shorter. Um, so then in my left shoe, it, they, there's like also like a built-in raise. So people would be like, wow, your shoes are so cool. Well, fun fact, it's the only pair of shoes literally in existence that fit me. Um, so if they ever stop making them, I am completely screwed. <laughs> You're barefoot. <laughs> uh, 
like I'm literally barefoot um because they because it's like my feet I don't know my feet are just little rectangles honestly like and they're like I don't know I feel like they're like thicker than normal plus they have to fit my like um my like orthotics in the shoe with (laughs) with my foot and then they're also wider like they just these shoes didn't want to be I mean my feet did not want to be contained I guess um so yeah I was able to wear more shoes as a kid but I think just everything they did to my legs over time they were just like yeah we're not fitting into normal shoes no more oh which, you know, as you've, as you've mentioned, is a bummer because I could be wearing Lightning McQueen Crocs right now. Right? <laughs> um, but instead, <laughs> yeah. But, um, so yeah, I have like a raise on my left shoe to like help even me out a little bit. Um, and then, you know, it did also affect my arms when I was growing, but apparently nobody cared or thought to do anything or noticed because um, my arms don't go straight. Uh, they don't they like at the elbow they just like don't straighten out all the way yeah like they can't lock right like yeah like they can't fully extend and then also um i can't turn my palms face up either they can only turn to about a handshake kind of angle um ironically i could turn them face up (laughs) (laughs) which is kind of gross um also i don't know what's going on in my wrists but i can touch my palm flat to my arm like i can just fold my hand like you know how cats like lay down with their paws folded under or like how people are double jointed like right or that's like when you bend your thumb all the way to your wrist but right yeah most people just do their thumb i'm like no the whole thing (laughs) um (laughs) so that's fun um What else do I got going on? Um, you know, it's like, it's so, oh, scoliosis. How could I forget? Um, so I didn't even know that I had scoliosis. I thought that I was, so I went to Shriners as a kid, um, which was a hospital that most, um, disabled kids, uh, go to, like, physically disabled kids, um, because it's, like, free, so, um, went there, usually you age out at 18, I was in the system when it was up till 21, so they kept me around, how nice, um, I was grandfathered in, um, love the seniority <laughs> perks, um, and then, yeah, so, like, I thought that I was, like, getting ready to graduate, I was like, what y'all need me here for anymore, and then one day, my leg doctor introduces me to who would become my spine doctor, and was like, yeah, so your scoliosis has gotten to a point where gravity will take over, and your spine will keep curving to the point that it, like, starts to, like, get tangled up with your organs if we don't, uh, surgically correct it, oh my and God. I was like, I was like, there's something wrong with my spine. <laughs> right? Like, like nobody said. I'm like, I've been so focused on my legs all these years. I had no idea. And I also had no idea how common scoliosis is. Most people don't have to get it corrected, I don't think. But, like, everybody I know has scoliosis. So, you know, we out here. I feel like I've known a lot of people that had to just wear, like, a back brace, like, for their mm. scoliosis. Like, I remember the which nurse Which I never doing did, tests. which feels insane. That does feel the same. What did they, so, like, how did they, you know, go about that? Well, so they had, they had been, I I mean, like, you know, occasionally when I would go in for my, like, annual appointments or whatever, they would just take all sorts of x-rays, because they are always concerned about, like, uh, people with dwarfism, like, our necks, they're always concerned about that, a lot of people end up having to have neck surgery later in life, um, but, you know, so they would x-ray my back, and I just didn't know, I was like, whatever, you know, I'm just here to be put in the machine, whatever, um, and so ended up, yeah, they were like, yeah, so we, yeah, you need to go in for surgery, um, and so this was actually my freshman year of college, and, um, and I was like, okay, I always plan for, like, winter break uh, mm-hmm. from my surgeries. That was the main thing as a kid, because since I'd be in full-length casts, it's like, why would I want to do that during the summer, you know? True. Um, would be horrible. Um, so, planned the same thing for the back surgery, and it was supposed to just be, you know, a quick hospital stay, you know, surgeries these days are a lot easier to recover from because technology has advanced so much. Um, basically, they... Uh, a lot of people do have to get scoliosis correction surgery, though, so it's pretty common um, in terms of they just put a rod and screws in your spine to straighten it out. It's called a spinal fusion surgery. Um, and so they did that, and I went home, and then 
I, the thing is, I don't remember a lot of that time because I was on so many painkillers and stuff that you're literally, I mean, when you have surgery, you're just high all the time. I There's <laughs> pictures of me as a kid where I just look completely out of it in the hospital, thrilled, like, just smiling big. It's like, oh yeah, she's on she drugs. She can't feel a thing. <laughs> she <laughs> feels nothing. Um... And so I really don't remember a lot, but I do remember that my incision was having issues healing and that there was a good chance that when I went in for my two-week follow-up that I would be readmitted. Uh, Yeah, turns out that it was like, yeah, not even a question, like, you are being readmitted uh, and also, you know, yeah, your, your back has not healed up, it has not closed in the way it was supposed to, and congrats, you have a super rare infection oh um, that people normally only get on their feet. <laughs> my doctor goes, uh, did somebody, like, walk on your back? <laughs> I'm like, excuse me? Oh, my God. Um, Athletes yeah, would, but for your back. Right. <laughs> and, you know, before I had the surgery, she was bragging about how, like, only one of her patients has ever gotten an infection. It's super rare, but they have to, like, warn you about it anyway. And I was like, well, I'm sorry, but I'm here to be number two <laughs> uh, for you. And, um, I mean, yeah, I think they ended up writing, like, papers about me because it was so rare and um anyway basically they had to take me in for surgery and scrub my spine every day and I was hooked up to like a vacuum that was like like draining sucking yeah it was yeah pretty gross and ridiculous and I was in the hospital for like two weeks um and then had to yeah get a pick line and go home on IV antibiotics um and during that time period I never got to sleep for more than eight hours at a time um because I had to have the um antibiotics every eight hours so yeah that was like I I would have them like every four hours and then oh god I would have one that because I would have like I'd be on like three different ones at a time so it was always this big uh thing and I remember being young and my mom coming in my room like, early in the morning to hug me up for my first one and then like oh being God. finished and then going to school and then coming home from school and doing my second one and then doing my other one before bed. It was always... I can't believe I ever complained about the eight <laughs> hours, but it's also like, well, the weird thing too is it's like while they were dealing with the infection, I was still recovering from the surgery. So I would be great. They would literally, I would get out of surgery and get completely dressed because like since I was like in there so long and stuff, like they were fine with me, like getting dressed acting normal Mm -hmm. like um and so I'd just be up and go like as if nothing had happened because you know I'm so sorry for your experiences with anesthesia (laughs) I was like knock me out taking a nap thanks like I it was great (laughs) I I loved anesthesia like I'm not even kidding I I don't do drugs but like (laughs) I'm like I don't do drugs but but I do but like I love it (laughs) um I loved that feeling of slipping under. It was, like, as closest to death you'll get as, like, an alive person. <laughs> like, I was obsessed with it. And, you know, I would always get super loopy afterwards to the point where I'd insult doctors. I'd, like, I would go hard roasting them for no reason, too. Like, I wasn't a hateful child, but, like, that brought out something in me. Oh, my and God. I remember they were like, dude, she's, like, vicious. Like, do not, like, go in, go in there, you know, change the bandage and get the fuck out. Like, do oh not stay God. in there over pestering. <laughs> because I also, like you were saying, where it's kind of funny to be, you know, when you're a child that's constantly exposed to traumatic things in the hospital. Because it's almost like you're kind of like, okay, like, this is what happened. Okay, I have, like, a super rare blood infection. Exactly. Okay. And that's, um, you know, that's something I was going to say, too, is it's, like, when you're born with this stuff, it it becomes your normal. You never know anything different. Yes. And so even, like, thinking through what I wanted to, like, share, like, on the podcast, I was like, huh, like, what is, like, how does it affect my daily life? Because I'm like, it's so normal to me that it's like what's not normal Mm -hmm. for other people so like some other things like the ways that like my disability like affects my daily life like I use like um one crutch to like get around um for like around the house and stuff and then um I have a mobility Mm -hmm. scooter for longer distances um and like obviously since I'm I have dwarfism I'm only three seven and so um like I have to use like pedal extensions to drive and stuff like that um I will say like compared to anything like 
the scoliosis surgery actually has had the most effect on my life because I used to be so flexible um like I could touch like like when I would like sit down on the ground like I could touch my elbow to like my foot you know it was like because I was so short it's like you know it's like um I got used to everything being so within reach and you know they said oh it'll affect your flexibility somewhat but like for me it was like pretty life-changing drastic like I simply cannot tie my shoes anymore because I cannot reach my feet um you know it's just like that's like probably one of the biggest things that like most like affects my independence um there's like things that I can do like there's there's mobility aids that exist but it's like right now it's like it's so much faster and easier and energy saving to just have somebody help me yeah and it's like you're so used to that so it's like you know why it's like oh unless it's something that like you specifically need like you know be something where like one day you'll eventually need obviously like living on your own and stuff like that but it's like okay like just save it exactly you know like if it doesn't need to get taken care of right now then it's okay well and that's the same thing with like other things like that I know that like will affect me more later on because that's like like I always have my mom put my hair up because it's like I my arms Mm -hmm. just are not long like it just doesn't work um yeah. But it's, like, I know there's, like, so many more th- ways that my disability is gonna affect me later on with, like, cooking and laundry and dishes. It's, like, especially having dwarfism, it's, like, I, I literally, the world is built for normal height people. Like, not only is it built for able-bodied people, but it's built for, norm- like, you know, five-foot-something yeah. <laughs> able-bodied people. Um, but, you know, I, otherwise, it's, like, most of the time, I'm not thinking about the fact that I'm disabled. Like, only when I encounter inaccessibility do I even really remember um I have been getting a little more like fatigue and joint pains which I kind of am not that surprised about I do feel like over the course of my life I wouldn't be surprised if like chronic pain becomes a thing for me um but you know right now it's all very tolerable I feel like I have a high pain tolerance anyway you know when I was planning for my future in high school, you know, as much as I didn't think I was gonna be alive, I was still loosely planning for something. So I wrote like a thesis paper based on how I wanted to be, um, I really wanted to work in audio production and audio design for Mm -hmm. music. And I wanted to, I really want to be like a producer. I would have loved to be like a mixer. Like I wanted to work in a recording studio. Um, and I had all these like, you know, big, dreams for myself and especially like living in New Jersey where I live is so close to New York and I was like I have all these opportunities at our train ride way and I should take advantage of that so um throughout my high school experience I was like I was always planning on going to community college just being close easy to live at home I was never I feel like I you know at 18 I was not ready to be on my own taking care of myself in another state um away from my parents or anything Mm -hmm. so um, I went to community college, did, I got a, um, uh, associate's degree in audio production and I was planning on going to a four-year school for my bachelor's, but in the summer between graduating and then going to school, I got really sick with a bacteria that, um, is abbreviated as AFB and it's something you can kind of get from like water or any, um, really just like showers, sinks, stuff like that, where for normal people, they either, you know, don't get it or they get it, but then like, you know, they're feeling fine. But for people with CF, it's one of those bacteria that really stick and like dig themselves into your lungs. So I ended up not being able to go to the four-year school I was planning on going to um, because of how, like, even though I was like, oh, like, I feel fine. It's like, no, but like, you're like, it's like could be like a light switch like Mm. the next day you could be terribly sick if this isn't under control um and it was a bit traumatizing and it was really sad you know to not be able to like that was like one of the first times in my life where I felt like my illness was really like you have your your dreams and yourself have to take the back seat right now because this has to be taken care of first and I saw a lot of new doctors in New York I actually saw one that was for like a lung transplant which was also another very, like, moment in my life where I was like, wow, like, my disease really is affecting me a lot more than, 
um, I, I thought it was, you know, I, I felt like it was. And I think having that conversation with someone about how, like, oh, if this bacteria doesn't get under control, like, you will have, like, there's a point in your future where you will need a transplant. And that was really scary. I feel like that was one of those moments where I kind of thought, like, I'm never going to be able to live a normal life. Like, no matter how many times or no matter how I, you know, where I'm like, oh, I could be having the best day. I could take care of myself the best way I could have. But your disability is still there. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, you're not it's not going to get in, you know, it's not going to get under control in the way that you wish. Very different, but also kind of similar is that I, you know, it's it's so funny that we, like, didn't know each other. I feel like our lives have followed such similar trajectories, um, just, like, even when we didn't know each other. But, you know, it's like when I was in high school, I was also, like, planning on, like, um, like, I really wanted to work in the music industry. I was, like, really involved in the local music scene. I was like, I why can't every small band that's really good, like, be as known and loved as, like, One Direction? Because uh, One Direction rise up, you know. Um, <laughs> Directioners. <laughs> and, uh, and, uh, and, you know, it's like, after I had my scoliosis surgery, it's like, you know, I had been going to shows for years without really questioning, like, um, accessibility, I would just always, like, be in the front in the crowd, like, with, you know, kind of being crushed against the stage without really questioning it, because I, right. I don't know, I'm a teenager trying to figure out how to navigate an inaccessible world, and, um, but after scoliosis surgery, I was like, I don't want the crowd crushing up against me, um, and so I started, like, asking venues, I was like, you know, is there someone I can watch without having to be you know crushed to death um and they had no idea what I was talking about because it turned out that like yeah music venues really aren't accessible um and that was like pretty devastating for me because I was like huh I like this industry that I care so much about and so desperately want to be a part of literally was not made with people like me in mind at all so what you know obviously when you were sick like that was your top priority um but I'm like I guess kind of like where did where did life go from there so life, life brought me here baby <laughs> <laughs> right here yeah, right everything here everything has led to this moment I mean I guess so um so you know that was 2018 um kind of flopped uh, I, w I felt like I was just really taking care of myself and I was working at like a retail job and just kind of like existing and chilling and just like, you know, going through the motions of everyday life with like no real purpose. Um, and I remember I had a lot of dark days that were like, wow, I don't know how the rest, like, I don't even know if I'm going to have like the rest of my life. Like, I don't know what's going to happen after this. I was on Trikafta 2019 and I remember just being able to, you know, just kind of be like, okay, cool. Like, let's see how this medication works. Like, let's see what happens. And then, um, I was considering going back to school and then, um, 2020 just decided to step in and, you know, everybody knows throw a wrench in the whole plans of everything that people were doing in their, in their lives. And it really, you know, in, in 2020, I, I just was like, you know, spending a lot of time with myself and just kind of allowing myself to, you know, just exist in this period and not get sick and make sure my parents took, you know, a shower when they got home from the grocery store and wiped down all the groceries. And, you know, like, I, I think it's a whole like, other... It's almost like being chronically ill is a full-time job. <laughs> Dead ass. Being chronic, like, it was like, bro, if one thing you're, one, one thing's for certain, your full-time job is going to be chronically ill for the rest of your life. During that time, I was just like wire wrapping crystals and you know I got really into crystals um for a few reasons of like I like the metaphysical idea of like oh this crystal being like carry this with you and it helps calm you down and you know they're very pretty to look at I was always into minerals and rocks you know type of stuff I was always into the mystical like I'd play in my backyard and imagine the fairies around me and you know all this like magical things that you do when you're a child um Never really grew out of that, so <laughs> I Love would. It. I basically became a small business owner where I um, made jewelry, still make jewelry, make it in my bedroom right here where I'm sitting at right now. Um, I got a part-time job working at a crystal store where I was able to make jewelry, and 
be a like jewelry designer and crafter and I love that a lot I love having this very I've always been so creative throughout my life as well that having this creative outlet now that I basically created a job for myself is very like wild to think about that you know I am my own boss at this point like at least in my business side of things like I'm my own boss. I'm my own employee. I'm my own, you know, I'm my employee of the month every month. I'm also <laughs> the employee that's on the verge of getting fired all the time, like, <laughs> you know, on, in my business. So Cassie, what about you? I know you were mentioning before about having to face like inaccessibility in like music spaces and how that kind of like, you know, became a huge catalyst for what you ended up like, you know, having to develop in your life. What are yeah. Your Yeah, so, I mean, at first I was just, like, so frustrated with uh, venues being super inaccessible, and I was just like, oh my god, like, this just wasn't, like, this industry I care so much about and really want to work in, like, isn't even accessible to me. Um, But in a way, like, none of that, even though I had never really thought about it in the capacity of, like, music spaces, it had been a normal thing for me my whole life. Like, every year in school, I would have to, like, sit down with the administration and be like, oh, like, this is how the school's not accessible, because it was built before the ADA. Um, Because with the ADA being signed in 1990, it's like, of course everything was built before then. And so it's, like, in a way, like, having to advocate for myself was nothing new to me, but, like, posting pictures online of, like, my view at shows and, ve- like, being, like, you know, this is what venues consider accessible, and, um, and at, and at that point, like, that's how I started figuring out that, like, disabled people across the country were experiencing, and really around the world, were experiencing this same issue of inaccessibility and um I think that's around the time that like you and I connected online because it's just like any like music fan who's like disabled or chronically ill it's like even though there's obviously tons of us it's like we kind of feel like we're all out here on our own little island um until we (laughs) connect through the internet so um that was nice to find community that way but um ultimately I ended up starting a nonprofit called Half Access to address the issue because I was like huh literally nobody's gonna do anything about this um so I guess why not why not me you know um and so you know started that uh the main thing is that it's like a database of detailed venue accessibility information because that was the most stressful thing is it's like going to a venue for the first time and not knowing what to expect because venues websites would just be like call us for information or they'd be like uh we're accessible okay to who because Um, a person who's deaf and a person who's in a wheelchair don't have the same accessibility needs. Um, and so, you know, so started that, um, and it's, it's kind of funny to talk about now because I'm still kind of not really used to talking about the fact that, like, I've actually now stepped down from half access. Um, but, you know, at the time, like, it really did end up fulfilling my desire to work in the music industry, um, to the point that I actually started thinking about other career paths, because I was like, oh, like, that fills that desire for me, but it's not gonna, like, make a living for me, um, and so actually around the time, like, just before COVID, I had actually started thinking about, like, oh, maybe when I go back to school, I'll go back to be, like, a teacher or a social worker, like, I was thinking about, um, other career paths and then COVID happened and obviously the music music industry came to a grinding halt and um and so in that time when obviously it's like we didn't even know if venues were gonna like be able to afford to stay open through the pandemic and so it's like well we're not gonna yell at them to like fix their accessibility right now um and so instead I ended up filling my time I like that was you know 2020 was a presidential year I started texting for Bernie like the Black Lives Matter movement was obviously like very big especially in the Portland area like there was like over a hundred days of protests and then 2020 was also the year that my county the entire like my entire county was under some level of evacuation order because of like Oregon's worst wildfire season and so there was just like I mean between COVID bringing up a lot of like equity issues in society and then just all these other things that happened to be happening at the same time plus it being a presidential year and me having a ton of time on my hands, um, (laughs) I, you know, ended up getting involved in activism and specifically, like, after the presidential, like, after the election was over, I was like, huh, like, I want to stay involved in, like, volunteering, like, doing this type of work, feeling like I'm having some sort of impact. 
Um, and so I, yeah, I joined Sunrise, the Sunrise Movement, I joined DSA, um, and really now have spent the past couple years, um, specifically focused on, like, fighting for climate and transportation justice, and so got to a place where I realized that, especially because I started thinking about running for office in the future, that I was like, huh, I just don't have the time or the passion that I used to, but there are plenty of other disabled people who do still care, do still feel safe going to shows, are still being affected by this, Mm -hmm. and who want to, like, carry on this work, and so um, brought on a bunch of new board members to have access, and am now in the process of kind of handing that off while I'm now, like, back in school full-time, um, just finishing my undergrad and now planning on working in community development, which is such a weird, um, like, to go from wanting to work in the music industry to, like, now wanting to be an urban planner. Uh, interesting way that life has taken me. So now we're going to move on to our final segment of the podcast and uh, we're gonna call this one now playing name may be changed in the future who knows but we're gonna talk about kind of what we're listening to what we're jamming to right now cassie would you like to go first yes um and on top of like what we're listening to like it could be other forms of media as well like what we're watching and stuff um or like you know our gamer girl Mariah, what she's playing. (laughs) Um, (laughs) I have been very obsessed with watching videos of people playing The Sims. I don't know. I think it's very relaxing. Um, Just good brain cleansing material. (laughs) Um, And then it's also college gymnastics season, and I feel like in another life, I would have been a gymnast. So I really enjoy watching college gymnastics. Um... And then other than that, I've been listening to Gracie Abrams' new album, Obsessively. Like, I kind of don't listen to much else anymore, but um, I am also really enjoying the few uh, new Boy Genius songs that have come out, and I'm excited for their new album. Love the new Paramore. Also still really enjoying Noah Kahan's album. Love that for you. Yeah, I definitely have been very into Boy Genius lately, um, which is funny because I really think, like, earlier this year I was listening to their EP, like, nonstop. Like, Me and My Dog, oh, Chef's Kiss. Best song. Incredible song. Um, so I've been listening to their, you know, the three singles that they came out with, and then I know um, they just had the music video come out as well for Not Strong Enough, and I really like that. Been vibing a lot to them. So I'm glad, you know, I'm excited for their new record to come out um, at the end of the month. Um, And as for other music I've been listening to, I've been listening to Paramore's new album, of course. And I like to listen to, uh, I don't know, I've just been getting into, like, listening to their whole, like, discography in full. Um, So I started with, you know, This Is Why, and I just finished After Laughter. So I know that it's just nice to, I don't know, to, like, kind of imagine what that, time was like for like Haley Williams writing those albums mm-hmm. you know like I always like to kind of put myself in like the artist's shoes and think about like what was going on in you know the world and in life at that time so, so you're going in reverse chronological order. yes I'm in reverse nice. order reverse chronological order yes <laughs> um and I'm also I me mean, like I say I'm a gamer before I'm <laughs> anything else like I'm a gamer before I'm a woman <laughs> um so I've been playing Stardew Valley um uh, which I think it's like they just had their seven year anniversary of the game the other day, which I thought was really cool because it's really like I've been playing it for so long. I think um, I, I've started like multiple like farms and maps and stuff. If you have any Stardew Valley questions, please come to me. Our expert. <laughs> I love that game. And um, I usually like to play that game at night and I like to listen to something while I play video games. So I've been listening to... Um, a streamer her name is gab smolders and she's been she has a whole like playlist on her youtube where she plays nancy drew games and i used to play those games when i was younger so i like to kind of like go back and like relive that experience of these very old like early 2000s like point and click walkthrough games so i've been listening to her play and it's very fun i like it a lot 
You know, it's a nice wind down activity at the end of the day. That's such a nice nighttime routine. Well, that's a wrap on this week's episode. Be sure to follow the Cassie and Mariah Show wherever you listen to podcasts at TCMS Pod on Twitter and Instagram. And look out for new episodes every Wednesday. Bye. Bye.